Your Royal Highness, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, a very good morning to you. May I start my presentation by thanking the hosts and getting that ball to stay still. <laughs> Can I th open my presentation with very warm thanks to the hosts for inviting WHO to this meeting. I think this is following previous years, and it's a great pleasure to be here to join you on this important topic. I hope you enjoyed the short video prepared, uh, as you can see, for the launch of the Global Action Plan. I'm delighted to be here to be able to share with you that. And what I'd like to do in my presentation is put some global context around the issue of physical inaction activity and how it's a global priority to work together across different sectors on the subject matter of this meeting, which is to create urban environments that will support all people being more active and, of course, children uh, particularly. Greetings from Dr. Tedros, the new Director General of WHO. He has set a new vision for us. It is shown in the red up here, promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. It follows very nicely and clearly based on the sort of information which we've just heard from my previous speaker. We must look at those emergencies and protect people. We must serve the vulnerable, those most in need. But we must also live up to our name, health, and promote health and well-being. We've got three billion goal. A billion people served, a billion people protected, and a billion people promoted in their lives, healthier lives. And it's within that third billion that the work and my group sit, promoting healthier lives, and in that, promoting physical activity. We are driven and focused by the Sustainable Development Goals, and health, as you see in our version of this, is at its center. We, WHO is responsible for 3.4, the, the Sustainable Development Target, to reduce non communicable disease. Mentioned previously, and I'll show you some statistics, but not only just non-communicable disease, it's through health we will enable and achieve many of the others. And that's why it's shown in the center. Working on health is key to promoting health and well-being to all, better prosperity, economic development, employment, housing, and, and, uh, and community and environmental sustainability. Non-communicable diseases, briefly shown in the earlier slide, 71%, three-quarters of the deaths of the world today are indeed due to non-communicable diseases, the chronic diseases. 41 million a year, but 15 million of those are in the age group of 30 to 70 years. Young in today's term, preventable. And that is why we're focused. Focused on the need to take the knowledge we have from the research, from the causes of non-communicable disease, into practice. We meet and we discuss, but there's a level of frustration now summarized by the third UN high-level meeting in September. It's time to deliver. And I was struck by our um, host's comments in the uh, program that we all share. It's time to take the policy commitments into action. Indeed, commenting here that we have failed to deliver, to deliver the promises of implementation. Physical activity is core. You see in this slide, a very simple slide, but the major causes Three of them have physical activity as a contributor. If we promote physical activity, we reduce these three uh, causes of death and disability. For those in the audience, and it's a broad church here, we've got many from health, but also and welcome from other dis disciplines. What is the evidence behind that? You see on this graph, going towards the right, no matter what level and increasing levels, the black lines go down, which is your risk of those chronic disease going down. I could change the y-axis to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, breast cancer, colon cancer. It is endless, the list that we have found. Three messages in blue. Anything is better than nothing. We do have a recommended range, and more is better.
And that's for all of us. The evidence in adults, the evidence in children, summarized in many of the documents you're seeing shown as front covers. We know it's core to ending our, uh, childhood obesity. We know it's core to achieving the uh, SDG goal. The benefits for children are known to this audience, but extend beyond preventing those future disease, but improving their health now, from very young through to young adulthood. And you can see the list here, and it's familiar to you, wide-ranging. The trouble is, the current levels of physical activity are disappointing. The concern is those not doing some they're not getting enough physical activity for the benefits I've just shown. One in four adults, three in four adolescents. These are global data. Let me show you the adults, and this is trend data we launched last year. Our progress is shown. Since 2001, we have failed to reduce that level. It's time to deliver, deliver the interventions we know that can change that level. Inequity. The blue shows men, the green shows women. In most countries across this decade and a half, women are less active than men. It is systematic. It is a product of the environments and opportunities and society. It's true in girls as well as boys, uh, as adults. Here I'm going to quickly show you for your cast your eyes. It varies around the world. But I want to show where we are sitting here in high income Western Europe we're on the wrong end of this graph. We are high, along with our colleagues in Latin America, Caribbean. It is only in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan, that there are lower levels, and a lot of that is driven by context and society. What happens with change? You see here, as countries progress economically, the effects of globalization, changes in transport, urbanization, leisure activities, we are seeing the increasing levels of physical activity. Our task globally, to encourage physical activity and retain the high levels where they are, to prevent and reverse the increasing levels in, mi in middle and high income countries. New data on young people will be forthcoming. We're going to replicate those detailed analysis in, uh, in data of adolescents uh, forthcoming in the next month or so. Turning to some national data, I want to highlight here that precipitous drop in the adolescent age. And many of you know this. Children are active younger, and then things change. Parental attitudes, environment, school, access to technology, mobility or less mobility. But this is the way the concern is. And that's why this conference is important, to focus on the young age so we can change the data both in young childhood and adults. Thus, the member states of the UN called on WHO to develop a new action plan, link with the sustainable development goals, use the best evidence, and provide a roadmap for implementation of action. We did that job. We delivered it last year and set a new goal, extending an existing goal to, to 2030. 15%. It's going to be a challenge, but working across multi-sectors and working on the causes in the environment, we can achieve it. In brief, it's structured around four policy areas. In each area, we've got policy recommendations, actions that we can implement. I want to briefly go through some of those, but focus on the one most, uh, most uh, prominent for this uh, conference. In red, number one, we've got to change our values, parental values for children being active, having time to play, um, making time in the family lifestyle, P attitudes of urban planners towards the value of open space, attitudes towards a knowledge of those benefits which I've just outlined. Policy action two focuses on the environment. The goal is to create safe, accessible places and spaces for everyone to have the choice and opportunity for physical activity. We know that urban design shapes how we live. Our previous speaker has just shown us. Foresight back in New York designed environments that actually encouraged and promoted health. 
the decades in between, or centuries even in between, we have changed and we haven't learnt those lessons. What is shown here is the disaggregation of the places you and I live. Where the streets, the shops, the schools, the homes, the parks, where they are influences your level of access and influences your use, and thus it influences your health. We know from the sort of research that's been done here in Sweden, done in Europe, and been done around the world now, that how we design and improving that design can change levels of physical activity. And I'm reporting some research done here in Western Australia, but it's been replicated elsewhere, that if we get it right, if we get the design and density with the distant destinations, the shops, schools, workplaces, uh, entertainment areas, and parks, and we get that distance right, we can get there in walkable or cyclable distances, we can double the likelihood of walking. That's a simple message. If we get this right, we can increase people's likelihood of walking. And we know that parks are important. Children who spend more time outside are more active. We know that's good for health for all the reasons of activity, contact with nature, and many other benefits. But it varies your opportunity. Again, returning to a theme introduced in the opening remarks, inequalities. Access to public open space, access to green parks, varies. I'm showing a slide on the right-hand side here of a city that's looked at this, looked at where their parks are, and looked at the distribution and it absolutely follows economic wealth. The rich areas have more parks, the poor areas have less parks. But not only the quantity, it's the quality of those parks. We have to bring these data and bring it to the table to discuss where are the budgets being spent, where are we investing, and remember the message of SDGs, leave no one behind. A principle of the action is to work for those who most need and are in most need of the environment. So here we see some examples in the area of public open space, but we could see others. The good news is amongst this room and collectively, we do know what to do. We do know the environment that will create physical activity, more active lifestyle, active mobility, and how to use those spaces. And picking up on the comment uh, um, from Dr. Alabasta, we know that we can open public spaces and get more activity, health benefits, social benefits, and community benefits. The third area in yellow is all about the programs, because it's not just the environment. We have to add to it the programs and opportunities. You know all this, those of you who are working in childcare, in schools, in workplace, the programs and ways of which we can engage, teach skills, encourage, support, and enjoy. But the programs without the environment is only half the work done. And there are many ways, but we must look at, again at equity, access for all ages and all abilities. And lastly, the work that we do as governments in designing policies, in research, in surveillance and data collection, in advocacy, we must have the systems supporting those previous three areas. So in total, the Global Action Plan is a set of four policy areas 20 actions, colour-coded. And I suspect across this room, we've got people working in at least one area and probably multiple. And we've got copies of the information for you to pick up. We launched last year celebrating sport and a football, but also celebrating the simple ways, play, walking, cycling, in a symposia with 100 local governments and indeed the uh, sporting context of the World Cup football, we celebrated the variety of ways we can be active and need to be active, making it part of everyone's day. And I want to ground this presentation and hopefully our discussions over the next few days that there really are for children three ways. We want them to be more active, more mobile, through walking and cycling and scooting and other ways to be active. So let's fix what's preventing, what's inhibiting, what's, what is not supporting that mobility. It's to do with the environments we build, it's to do with the governance structures, and it's to do with creating the values that that's important and valued way to travel. 
A second way is through active play, and you've seen the parks, but it's also at home. It's the garden space, it's the open space, the use of roads, it's at school. The facilities, the amenities, the space for being active before and after school. And of course there's through sport, and sport must be challenged, challenged to engage more children in more activities they need and want to stop that precipitous drop I showed. We can do this because the knowledge in this room can help us design those environments. The knowledge in this room and emerging knowledge can change the governance structures, opening up parks and playgrounds, uh, school grounds for use by the communities after hours. That's a governance issue. Speed limits, a governance issue. Closing the streets, a governance issue. Making sure we have good governance that enhances physical activity is absolutely necessary. And of course, we must work on changing cultural norms. We need to collectively advocate, improve and inform people around in all professions about the importance of this agenda. In my last few minutes, I'd like to tell you what WHO is now doing and focusing on, given the launch uh, has already taken place. We're one year into the implementation with our focus on 2030. We have four areas. One of them is the global governance. It's our responsibility to provide the global advice to countries, to cities, to communities and stakeholders on physical activity and its role and contribution. We launched just a few months ago new guidelines on the importance of physical activity for young children under fives. This engages childcare settings, childcare um, the sector, it is new evidence, and it's strong evidence, that uh, patterns of physical activity are formed in early years, and we must, as parents and as the community, provide those opportunities. A second area of governance is updating our global guidelines. I showed at the beginning a graph of the latest guidelines showing the recommended amount that we should be doing, 150 minutes for adults, five times 30, a message you might know. But we're updating those. I know many of the researchers, and I hope government officials here will be interested. We're looking at the latest evidence on, on physical activity and on sitting and sedentary time in youth, adults, and older adults, and special populations like pregnancy, people living with chronic disease, people living with impairment. We hope these will be launched. Our schedule is later, uh, second half of uh, 2020. We are also charged with providing a monitoring framework for the implementation of the Global Action Plan. We have the policy actions, we have the recommended ways and uh, information to implement, but we now need to monitor. Data drives, and we saw the power of data in the earlier presentation. We're designing process, outcome, and impact measures. It will look something like this when it's populated for each of the policy actions. What can we see? How can we ju judge and monitor in Uppsala, in Stockholm, in Sweden, and in all countries progress on this agenda? If we don't implement, we won't achieve the goal. We're looking at those indicators, and I'm going to be listening and talking with you all to be informed by what indicators should populate these three areas, globally, nationally, and at city level. Some measures are possible at the city level. Some levels measures will be more suited to national and global. A second area is tools for action. We want to make sure the best evidence from wherever that is in the world is shared. And we're developing tools, and Active is our toolkit, that will cover and provide the best evidence and practice for schools, for walking, for promoting cycling, for promoting good and healthy parks, for cities. And these are forthcoming as a series of um, chapters to a toolkit called Active. A third area and a new set of tools is how we can move from nice to do things to regulation and must do. I repeat again, we know what to do. We have a knowledge of how to build places which will encourage children to cycle and walk and play. They're in guidelines, street design, toolkits, etc. But they're only if you want to, a suggestion available information, but we need to move to regulation. 20 mile an hour speed limits, 
quantifying how much public open space, quantifying the distance to schools. It is being done. It is possible. But this will mean that what we are talking about can actually get put into the written regulatory environment that will ensure it is done. And my fourth area of WHO work is to share with you our work on partnerships. Partnerships within the UN, I'm delighted to be accompanied by colleagues from two UN agencies. Joining forces is going to be critical. We share knowledge, share influence and share partnerships and we need to work better together and that's one of our priorities. But also, and this is just one example, working with sectors like sport, making sure there is sporting facilities that are open and available in communities, available for boys and girls, that attract the adolescents, not the drop-off I showed earlier. We're working with IOC and hope to work with Olympic legacies, such as forthcoming Paris 2024. And we're working with those other sporting agencies that are interested in using the power of sport to promote and encourage children in their communities to participate and not just spectate. Can it be done? Yes. This is my last slide, and it shows you the front cover of policy and action plans, new and launching in recent weeks from countries that are taking on this agenda. I was recently in China, and they have set an ambitious plan with metrics for improving and retaining physical activity in children. So is France, with sport and health jointly having an action plan. I look forward to discussing with you Sweden, your national action plan, and across Europe, making sure this slide requires more and more uh, front covers and documents to be added. There is a very good golden opportunity, clear policy, clear agenda, clear need, and the collective action of us all working for a more active, healthier world. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay for a moment. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for, are you gonna, are you gonna throw the ball out? To I the might audience? give it. Yeah, <laughs> you might give it to someone. Thank you for a most inspiring speech. We have time for a um, few questions, Mom. Is there, yes, please, one question here, and I saw someone there, yes? Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Gill, I'm an independent researcher. I'm also a Londoner and was in London for the Olympic Games in 2012, which was an amazing experience. But I wanted to ask you about your view on the impact of mega sporting events in terms of physical activity, because my sense is that in that respect, they're failing. And, and in fact, you could argue we're being sold a false prospectus, and that maybe it's, it's time those of us who are working in promoting physical activity uh, you know, own up to that, that whatever else the merits of these big global sporting events, they are failing to raise participation and physical activity levels. I agree with your summary, but not your conclusion. Mm. I agree, they failed. And that is why WHO is working with the leading organisation, IOC, to say it's time to do better. And Paris has made the phone call to WHO and said, how do we make it better? How do we deliver on that promise that's written in words in nearly every Olympic bid, and certainly in 2012 and, be and, and previous years? So you're absolutely right. But the potential is there, the opportunity, the visibility, but we have to convert that into the real legacy. So the purpose of that partnership is to be honest, to bring the stakeholders together, to learn from what London did do right, but also to share it and do much better and change that summary statement, which is they've failed, to how they can do it and it make it a success. It's optimistic, but it cannot be neglected. Otherwise, the words remain rhetoric, and, we ne and, and I think there's a real interest. There's an important important interest because the Olympics is a major investment for a country and for a city and it should deliver more than just an event. So I look forward to working with many stakeholders and trying to address that. Mm -hmm. We have another uh, question here. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Karin Ulfstotter-Krepin, the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences. Commercial forces are often seen as being the trigger of sedentary behaviour by um, uh, by offering uh, attractive products and services that limit physical activity. 
and um, to the, reduce the negative impact of these commercial solutions, governmental and non-governmental uh, organizations try to compensate for this by developing rules, regulations and recommendations or provide compensating activities. A parallel. Some 20, 30 years ago, this was the case when it came to climate and environmental issues. What has happened is that responsible companies now integrate the issues of climate and environmental in their product development. We've, we can see, we meet at the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences companies that are so interested in understanding how they can integrate the new findings when it comes to physical activity and the good things it does to young people and all people. What do you think from your perspective? Is it likely that we will see in the coming years a growing interest in the same way that um, responsible comp companies integrate physical activity and other, other lifestyle factors in their product development? Yeah. So I'm being asked to make a short answer, but thank you for raising a very important issue of the commercial determinants, and they're very clear in the areas of obesity with some of the, uh, uh, the industry uh, contributions and reactions to that. In the area of physical activity, there's both an opportunity for convergence with the industries and the sectors that wish to promote physical activity. So in answer, yes, I'm hoping that there will be an integration, uh, both private sector as employees, to recognize their employers should be employees should be more active and encourage it, um, but also as service providers. And hence my slide showing working with the private sector who actually run the sports clubs, the recreation, and the uh, opportunities for children and for us as adults in the community. There is, of course, however, the um, negative side, where there are those where there is um, uh, divergence in interest, where one an offsetting of interest, and we have to work in the space of trying to work with those that can actually help us, which is providing more opportunities in safer places and more accessible for everyone to participate. I think there is the time is now is to work in that um, convergent space with due regard and recognition as public officials to the negative consequent negative possibilities or consequences. But I look forward to that discussion as we uh, have these two days of, uh, of the meeting. So thank you for your question. And thank you, Fiona. You will also get this wonderful book from Astrid Lingen in English. For you. <laughs> you. Maybe you yes. can My lead uh, the football game during the lunchtime. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very indeed. much.